Good. Well, thanks very much. Let's hope this works. It seems like it's remarkably slow lag. Anyway, thank you very much, Michael, for inviting me. And I'm going to give a, a presentation on, on my view of rewilding. I'm my own means a definitive expert on rewilding. And there are people in this room who are much more up to date than I am. So please um, feel free to chip in or um, correct and add. But essentially, what I'm going to do is, is, is give a, a, a talk about what rewilding is um, and some indications of how mathematics might be able to become involved. Okay, well, so rewilding as a concept really got started in North America in about the 1990s. And initially, it was developed as a concept to try and address the fact that large mammals have been lost from ecosystems, particularly with regard to the extinctions after the, at the end of the plasticity. And okay, sorry folks, thanks. I think we're back on track. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so where I was was that uh, rewilding really started in the 1990s in the US. Um, it was a suggestion in response to the plasticity extinctions where it's, it's become very obvious that um, <laughs> natural formal incentives have been heavily distorted. Um, arguably by, by humans, and a realization that large, large animals, particularly large mammals, terrestrial large mammals, are very consequential with regard to ecosystem function. And so the loss of those large mammals has cascading effects on the ecosystem by virtue of the way in which these, these large animals moving across the landscape, feeding on a very poor scale, open up niches and facilitate processes for other species. Next slide, please. Okay, and so this notion of Pleistocene rewilding emerged. The idea that a group of nut job scientists are trying to go back into the ice age and repopulate uh, the continent with these extinct animals is how rewilding started to become known. And it attracted a certain amount of derision among scientists as being a bit of a practical idea. And attached to that was the notion that maybe we can actually rebreed some of these extinct species. And so the notion of de extinction emerged and also became associated with rewilding, the idea that maybe we can clone mammoths and we can inject DNA from mammoths into the denucleated eggs of um, an elephant and then develop an embryo and then plant it in an elephant and then start breeding mammoths again. Or uh, northern white rhinos, which have now gone extinct, in theory, they, it could be cloned and then southern white rhinos could be used as surrogate mothers for them and they could be rebred and so on and so forth. And so this has um, generated a fair amount of interest and has also became associated, become associated with the concept of rewilding. Next slide, please. But the trouble is that you can't actually go back in time. You can't recreate these mammal forms. And part of the problem is that the very really large mammals um, cannot exist with the areas of remaining habitat that are available to the nut. And we can't actually recreate enough habitat to support viable populations of these really large mammals. And so I'll just explain very really briefly the ecological basis behind this. If we look at a distribution um, of the area of the species as range, this is the total area on a continent that, is, that an entire species occupies in relation to body mass. We find that there's a wedge-shaped distribution in that we can uh, find that animals of relatively small body size can occur in very large and very small species ranges. But animals of large body mass cannot occur or do not occur in species ranges that are small. And that's a, that's a, that's a very um, empirically supported and theoretically supported pattern. Next slide, please. The reason is that this here, this, this missing part of the distribution is an extinction zone in that large bodied animals 
occurring in small species geographical ranges that extend to evolutionary time. Next slide, please. And the reason is quite simple. If you have a certain amount of area, uh, which is a species range, and the species population is of a certain size, each individual animal in that population needs a certain amount of area in which to carry out its life, particularly to feed. Next slide, please. Now, if you were to take the same number of animals, but now you consider a larger species, each individual animal is going to require more area to move around and to feed, et cetera. And so therefore, the species population will need a much larger area. Next slide, please. <clears throat> but if you only have a small amount of area for a big species, you can only have a small number of individuals occupying that area. And so therefore, if this is your species distribution, you're going to have a small population size within that species. Next slide, please. And so your theory is that these large animals that occur at relatively low population densities and can only occur in small numbers if they occur in small areas will go extinct. We can test that empirically, and here are some data from African savannas looking at large herbivores in African savannas. Next slide, please. And we can see that there's actually pretty much the same expected distribution. We don't get big body animals occurring in small areas. Because those big bodied animals in small geographical ranges become vulnerable to external um, extinction factors like, like hunting and disease, et cetera, et cetera, as well as internal, like in breeding depression and genetic drift. Next slide, please. And the problem that we face within the modern world is that humans have modified the landscape so dramatically, I mean, absolutely dramatically, that there's just very little habitat left over vast expanses to support viable populations of the larger body representatives of the fauna of any one of the particular continents. And so whether we like it or not, the, the communities of naturally occurring organisms at least on land, have been distorted by humans to a profound extent. And we're not going to be able to get them back because this landscape, this is Central America, Central North America, isn't going to change back into dreary anytime soon. Next slide, please. And so to recap quickly, looking at an evolutionary time scale, the natural extinction risk is driving this extinction zone. Next slide. But in historical time, since humans have been on, on the scene, we've got a flip in the distribution pattern. And now we have large bodied species that have been forced into small geographical ranges. And that cannot last. That is going to disappear. This point of this wedge is disappearing already. We've got African elephants, for example, occurring in small population sizes and small fragments of, of rain. Rhinos, of, northern white rhinos, already disappeared. Um, black rhinos are really having a very hard time. White rhinos are having a very hard time. And so it's, a, it's, it's, it's just a fact of life that these large bodied species that are forced into small geographical ranges are basically walking dead from the evolution point of view. So, what do we do then about the functional properties of those large species within ecosystems? Next slide, please. Part of the problem is that these large bodied species have got slow reproductive rates. And the rate of offtake from those populations is higher than the rate of replacement by reproduction. And so habitat loss, overharvesting, large bodied species are very, very vulnerable. Um, and so they're disappearing and have disappeared. Next slide, please. So we have this gap. In, in, in the larger body component of, 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 of the community. The functional properties of those species have been unwittingly substituted in many places. This is North America, where I've been working for the past 18 years. And the, the federal government, through the Bureau of Land Management, has an adaptive program of beating down vegetation because there's rapid woody encroachment in areas. Um, it's a multi-billion problem to control the encroachment. These are woody plants that would 
if the mammoths and the mastodons and the gonfers were out there at um, naturally occurring densities, they would be breaking them down just like the African elephants do in African savannas. But they're not there, and the woody encroachment of pinion juniper and various other species of woody plants is causing a major problem on rangelands. And so mechanical means are used <coughs> in order to substitute the effects of those large bodied species in the ecosystem. Now, the concept of rewilding is thinking do we have to go to machines? Can we go to maybe a combination of machines and animals? And what kind of animals might be put there? Thinking pragmatically about what the options might be to try and recreate the functional properties of the large body organisms that used to occur in that ecosystem. Next, please. And indeed, in some ecosystems um, in Western Europe, um, this is Urspiders plus in the Netherlands, large body species have been intentionally introduced into areas to have intended effects on that ecosystem. This is an area that used to be under the ocean. This was seabed about 40 years ago and was created by building a, a dike, pumping the seawater out over the dike. And then there was these huge expanses of, of mud flat that were exposed. Very soon, geese started coming in there and, and defecating and dropping seeds that they picked up where they'd been feeding. Grass started growing. And very soon, other birds started coming in there, other seeds started coming in there, and there became thickets of woodland becoming established, this thick woody vegetation. And the managers of this area thought, well, we need to get some breakdown of, of that vegetation. We need to get some grazers in there, we need to get some browsers in there, we need to break this up. And so, in a very visionary way, decades ago, the forestry agency in the Netherlands introduced <clears throat> a range of large herbivores particularly cattle and horses, red deer, et cetera. And now this ecosystem is just rich, diverse, with a wide variety of, of birds and uh, various uh, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, et cetera, et cetera. Very high biodiversity, a very favorite area for bird watchers, the nature walkers, and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> is functionally very diverse. There are, there are wetlands and there are patches of forest and there are patches of open meadow. And um, quite clearly, this large mammal assemblage has had a major effect and he's having a continuously strong effect in maintaining the heterogeneity in that system. But of course, these are not wild animals. Introduced for functional purposes. They weren't introduced because it would be nice to have horses and cattle. They were introduced to do a job. Next slide, please. And of course, <laughs> rewilding does not have to apply to animals. There's no logical reason why it has to apply to animals. And indeed, urban rewilding is a concept which is rapidly gaining interest. And the notion is to try and establish green spaces in cities, which might have been brown spaces in the past, to inspire people to be able to get out into a little bit of nature um, and witness something wild. So this is the High Line uh, area in New York, which is an abandoned railway running through New, New York City, which has been planted to vegetation and is now allowed to just do its own thing. There's not a manicured area. It is, it, there's no horticultural activity going on there with special displays of flowers or anything like that. There's just a diversity of vegetation that was introduced and it's allowed to just do its own thing. And it's, it's a wild space. And people love it, and it's extremely beneficial in terms of mental health and well being. People living in a city being able to get out there into some wildness. And so, rewilding does not have to be restricted to large animals. It's just that's where the concept originates. And it's, it's among the large animals that, that, that we can actually grapple most effectively, I think, with a lot of these concepts that I'll explain. Next slide, please. <laughs> Trouble is, over, time, over the recent time, the rewilding term has become associated with just about anything that people want it to be associated with. <laughs> it just has literally gone wild. Um, and there are some popular authors who've popularized notions about what um, back to wildness really means. And 
as a consequence nowadays, when you talk about rewilding among people, scientists, um, environmentalists, <coughs> the general public, everybody has a different idea about what rewilding actually is. Next slide, please. It's only in the last five years or so that Natalie um, and Sarah and, and myself have been working on this in a very concerted way. And through the leadership of Natalie, um, introduced the first definitive scientific book on capturing this concept of rewilding to try and pull together ideas from people about what is rewilding, how does it work, what's it all about. Next slide, please. And so there's a de definition of rewilding that has emerged. And essentially, the definition from a scientific perspective is that it's the reorganization of biota and ecosystem processes to set an identified social ecological system on a preferred trajectory, leading to the self sustaining provision of ecosystem services with minimal ongoing management. So that's a formal definition. It's quite a mouthful. A lot of concepts packed into it but that's essentially where we're at and i'll try and unpack a little bit of what's behind that now next slide so we've got this term rewilding part of the problem is the re of rewild that's what some a lot of people get hooked up about next slide please what i'd like to think about is the re of rewilding um, being similar to the re of reorganizing or retooling or regenerating or rethinking Wildness. It's not rebuilding some original state of wildness. It's the re, which might be considered the re of remodeling your kitchen. You're not going to back back to what it was. You're changing it to something that works better, or changing it to something that's needed to work the way that your environment at present requires it to. So that re of rewilding can be considered in a variety of different ways. And unfortunately, I think the, the confusion nowadays is that the re of rewilding assumes it means going back to what it was when it was wild in the past. Next slide. But going back to the past would be restoring, and the rewilding is not the same as restoring. The big difference between rewilding and restoring. Next slide. So restoring means putting things back the way they were. So the painting um, on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, beautiful Michelangelo, 16th century, creation of Adam, and fantastic painting, not all grimy and grubby with candle smoke and so on and so forth. And so a team of people in the 1990s launched a major campaign with a huge amount of money and restored it, restored the painting back to what it looked like when Michelangelo originally painted. Um, at least, hopefully they did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's getting it back to the way it was. In a natural sense, restoring can be putting bison back on the landscape in the, in the North American uh, wilderness area, to bring it back and establish it the way it was, okay? Next slide, please. Rewilding, though, is all about function. It's about making an ecosystem work and establishing all of the functional processes and properties, all the cogs and gears and machinery in that ecosystem to make it work and deliver ecosystem services. And then once it's working, to be able to keep working. And that might involve using the cogs and gears and bits of machinery that are available. And in this case, it might not be wild species that have gone extinct, but it might be surrogate species, domestic animals, that do the same job perfectly well, but there's no purest connection to what was originally there. Next slide, please. So a very useful metaphor for considering this concept is the adaptive cycle, which was developed by Buzz Holling and is um, described well in, in a chapter of theirs, Holling and Gunderson. And essentially, what this is is to, if, if you can imagine a couple of axes for an ecosystem. So, you have an ecosystem which is a, a complex adaptive system, it's continually changing. And at various times, you could plot some level of connectedness in the ecosystem. Connectedness meaning 
the interactions that are going on between species, the amount of interaction within species of, across taxa in that ecosystem. And you can also pl plot potential of the ecosystem, meaning the number of niches that are available, the number of opportunities for species to occupy space in that ecosystem. <clears throat> and then if you do that, you will see that through time, the system is continually in flux. There's always change. Next slide, please. And this cycle has got two components to it. There's what's called the for loop and the back loop. Next slide, please. So let's start here. Let's consider a, a state within this system. We'll call that the K state. That's known as K for carrying capacity. This is the stable state, a climax state. This could be a, a forest in a climax state where you've got mature canopy, the system is stabilized with maximum species richness, and then there's a fire. So there's a lightning strike or a volcanic eruption or something like that, the system catches fire. There's a massive release. The species are just, the, in the, the organisms within species are destroyed. There's a complete release of everything. And very rapidly, the system moves into what's called the omega phase, which is this phase of just release. The system is collapsing. It's giving up its property. It then cycles in the back loop into the alpha phase of reorganization. And what you've got here is you've got new propagules. Seeds are blowing in on the wind. They're starting to germinate. They're becoming established on this bare soil, which is now full of nutrients that were released by the fire. There's very little competition initially, and so lots and lots of species can get established, and there's a very high density of growth. You've got lots of little insects in there and small mammals feeding on, on this abundance of, of new growth. And so there's quite high potential, but so far there's not a lot of connectedness because the system is very unstable. It's, it's going through reorganization. Then there's going to be competition among those different species, and some are going to make it and some are not going to make it. The environmental conditions that prevail are going to act as a filter and allow certain species to become established. And then we go through this long, slow, four loop R phase, the growth phase, growing back again up into the climax. And these cycles are continually in operation at multiple levels, from patch levels to habitat levels to ecosystem levels. And so <laughs> that's the way that this adaptive cycle works. Next slide, please. Now, if we now have a look at where restoring and rewilding fit into the adaptive cycle, restoring is all about trying to get the system back to the way it was as quickly as possible. If there's a devastating fire in a, in a, in a very famous and revered forest, restoration would be to try and get that forest back, okay? Repair it, repair the damage headed back to the forest. However, rewilding would be thinking about allowing the system to go back into the reorganization phase and allowing the system to be wild, allowing new property deals to come in there, allowing the system to filter its own successful members. Um, and allowing the system to go through this, this, this reorganization, bearing in mind that the reason for the fire might have been climatic, it might have been changed environmental conditions, it might have been drought, and it might be that the K state will require a different assemblage from the assemblage that was there prior to that massive disturbance. And so that reorganization will enable a new community to assemble, which is more likely to be able to survive and become established under the new conditions. So those are the real differences then between restoring and rewilding. And of course, the option also exists for the system to have changed so radically, such as, for example, through climate change, that it's not going to go back to the way it was and is going to move into a totally novel ecosystem, in which case the rewilding concept can be a very useful tool to enable that to happen in a desirable way. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to use another metaphor. <laughs> Metaphors are really great for as heuristic tools for learning. Let's think about 1950s classic American car, Chevy or something like that. 
the parts break down. The water pump breaks. The, the head gasket blows. Something goes wrong. It's not going to work anymore. If you're a purist, you might argue that's a classic American car. You've you got to get the right part. You've got to replace that water pump with the real thing. And indeed, wealthy enthusiasts do that. And there's, you know, there's there's online clubs trading original parts, manufactured parts for a particular year and model of a Chevy, and you can restore these things. And that's restoration. That's restoring it back to the way it was and maintaining it the way it was. So when these white wall tires break down, you find some white wall tires that are exactly the same. When the water pump wears out again, you get another one that's exactly the same. And you maintain it and you restore it and you keep it. And it's 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 a lot of a lot of effort, a beautiful thing, and there's a lot of value in it. Next slide, please. But now consider. You've got a 1950 Chev and it's your only vehicle, and you are a taxi driver in somewhere like Havana in Cuba, and you can't get the parts. You just can't get them. And letting your vehicle just stand abandoned in an in a empty lot is not an option because you've got to get on with your job. You need that functional property. You need that functioning system. So if you go to Havana now, you will see these 1950 Chevys roaring around the place. But if you pop the hood, you're likely to find that the engine is a diesel cement mixer engine and the wiring is stripped from a Chinese washing machine mm -hmm. and the tires come from something else entirely. Okay, so the parts have been brought from all over, but they are functionally appropriate and they've been established in the system in a way which enables the system to operate and maintain function. And so this is an analog, if you like, of rewilding in natural systems, where instead of having bison in the ecosystem, you have cattle. Instead of having zebra in the ecosystem, you have horses, but they do the job. Okay. Next slide. So, to quickly summarize some of the, the main differences then between restoring and rewilding, relevance of historical benchmarks for restoring is higher, rewilding is lower. Fidelity to taxonomic precedent, precedent with restoring is higher, rewilding is lower. Predictability of system dynamics with restoring is higher because you are forcing the system to go back to the way it was and you're actually driving it to the way it was. And so the predictability is high. But with rewilding, predictability is low because you don't know what's going to happen in that reorganization phase, what's going to make it and what isn't going to make it. The management commitment clearly with restoring is continuous. You've got to maintain this all the time. Whereas the idea with rewilding is that it's tapered. You start off from the beginning by maybe a fairly large management intervention to set things up. And then the plan is to let it take over and do its own thing and you don't interfere. The motivation, motivation for translocations and the restoring is species composition to get the species assemblage back the way it was. Whereas with rewilding, it's all about functional type composition. Taxonomic substitutions in, re in restoring are resisted. We want to get back to the way things were, get the species back that we're missing. Whereas in rewilding, it's totally accepted. Probably we can substitute species. If we can't get the original species, we can put in another one if it works. Environmentally driven system transformation with restoring is resisted. The climate changes if the environment is changing. Well, we're going to you know, water those plants or we're going to put up fire breaks and we're going to protect the system so that it can be back the way it was. With, whereas with rewilding, you accept it. The environment's changing, the system has to change, has to adapt. <clears throat> Emergence of novel ecosystems with restoring is resisted. The idea is to keep the existing ecosystem. With rewilding, it's accepted. And generally speaking, with restoring, involving people in nature is more exclusive, more of a national park type approach, don't have too much human disturbance, human effect. Rewilding, it tends to be much more accepted, putting humans into the system. Next slide, please. So I'll give you an example here, um, a real world example of um, how rewilding might be seen in a real world situation. So here we are in Florida, the Everglades National Park is an area with uh, 
swamp land, tall forest, was occupied by or is occupied by a predator species known as the Florida panther. It's actually a cougar or puma, which is a relics population occurring in the Florida Everglades. Less than 100 individuals over time with um, inbreeding and genetic drift become non viable. Next slide. And so this has been a problem. What do we do? The Florida panther is, is, is going extinct. But we need a top predator in the Everglades because this ecosystem needs a top predator to control the herbivores. And especially some of the invasive species like feral hog that have come into that system. And so the idea was introduced to introduce genetic recipes. So bring in DNA from closely related cougars that were found to be in West Texas. So the most closely related cougars to the Florida panther is in the arid rangelands of West Texas. And so some animals were introduced from West Texas into, into the Everglades. They were allowed to breed and hey presto, genetic diversity was restored, breeding was restored, all of those genetic problems were, were resolved. Next slide, please. <laughs> of course, over time, because there's only so much habitat in the Everglades and animals can't expand their range and the population can't grow big, inbreeding continues. And so gradually, over time, the same problem emerges. You end up with inbreeding depression, and you need another genetic rescue. So eventually what happens is we end up with a species occurring in the Everglades that is no longer the Florida panther, even though people might want to call it the Florida panther. It's actually a cougar that's <laughs> adapted to the arid rangelands of West Texas. So that's you know, the sort of restoration-focused genetic recovery approach to this problem. Meanwhile, the Everglades is continually undergoing change. Seawater levels are rising. The system is becoming much more swampy. And the, the, the need for a top predator isn't going to go away. And so do we just keep on doing this and, 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 and bringing in these rangeland-adapted cougars and pretending that we have a Florida panther? Next slide, please. From a rewilding perspective, a much more pragmatic solution would be to say, you want a top predator in the Everglades, adapted to the ecosystem, we've got a top predator to yeah, yeah. To come in from the Yucatan Peninsula, just across the Gulf of Mexico, short distance away, much closer than West Texas, exactly the same ecosystem, same plant species, same system. The jaguar occurs sympatrically here with the puma, which is the same as the cougar. They were never in Florida because they couldn't get all the way around there. But they, if they could, they would. And under a rewilding scenario, it would be a question of how can we achieve function in this ecosystem to get in the top predator? And a totally exotic alien species that's never occurred there before could be very simply easily introduced. Obviously, it's anathema to conservation biologists. Crazy idea as far as conservation values is concerned, but from a functional point of view, as the Everglades keeps changing and becomes more and more and more swampy, the idea of having West Texas cougars in there becomes even more aggressive. Okay, <laughs> next slide, please. So, ecosystems all over the world are being transformed and have been transformed. This is the Great Basin of North America, massive area that is the catchment of uh, the Colorado River, and it's fundamentally changed from the ecosystem that it was 150 years ago. It is now basically a Eurasian steppe in North America. It's got uh, horses, feral horses all over it, and it's full of invasive species like uh, Russian thistle and Russian olive and um, cheap grass and all the European uh, Eurasian steppe species. Multi-billion projects to try and restore this ecosystem. Next slide. But it's just not an option. It's just not going to work. We can't get rid of the horses. We can't get rid of those invasive systems. Climate is changing. That system has changed and it is changing. Next slide, please. But rewilding is always an option. Doesn't matter where you are and what ecosystem you're in, rewilding is always an option. And funnily enough, rewilding has been in practice in this ecosystem for decades because the US government has been introducing species of, of vegetation, of plants, that come from Eurasia, that are well adapted for the conditions that now occur in the Great Basin. 
And so the American government flies in seeds of various species of plants, this is part kosher, for example, because they're so well adapted to being established in this system and withstanding herbivory by the invasive herbivores that are now right in that system. They just don't call it big wild. They call it rangeland management. <laughs> Next slide, please. So here we have a situation where rewilding is becoming a very popular concept. Here in the UK, it's, it's, it's embraced by many and feared by many. And so we need to think about, you know, what is rewilding and what is restored? Now, rewilding can never be a subset of restoring because rewilding isn't going to get things back to the way that they were. But restoring could be a subset of rewilding in that if the intention is to try and repair function, it might involve translocating in species that used to occur there and restore them back to get that system working again. And that would be rewilding. But it doesn't necessarily follow that each one is a subset of the other. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, this is where rewilding is. This is what I consider to be at least um, to be the state of the, of the science right now. And the question is, well, how can mathematics, well, how can mathematics get involved? And I suggest there are a number of ways in which that can happen. If we have a look at these transitions between states in the adaptive cycle, the probability of a transition from the K to the omega is something that could, in theory, be calculated. There's a probability function that will determine the likelihood of moving from there to there and from there to there, et cetera, et cetera. So getting a mathematical handle on these probability functions, I think it's, it's a very really good place to start. Be able to understand the likelihood of a system going through the organization and going back to the where it was, or getting off into a different ecosystem. Those are probability functions that are mathematically tractable. Next slide, please. The other thing is that each community of, of in this case, large mammals, is made up of functional types. And the functional type composition of a community will vary depending upon the environmental conditions. And here what I've got just for illustration is a large herbivore community in African savannas. These are two African savanna communities. Um, the one is a moist oligotrophic woodland savanna. The other one is an arid eutrophic grassland savanna. The functional types are really crudely defined by feeding style, grazers, mixed feeders, and browsers, and then large, medium, and small body size. And if we take the total biomass of that community and we divide it up into these functional types, how much biomass is made up of each functional type, we can get a distribution of that biomass described for a particular community in a particular ecosystem. We then take a community in another ecosystem and it's got a very different distribution of biomass across functional types. Now we know we've got a pretty good handle on the functional type distribution across different assemblies of species in different ecosystems. And as climates change, we are likely to expect a transition from one ecosystem type to another. So therefore, we should expect a transition in the functional type composition of that community from what it was to something else. And we should be able to predict what the, the, that next functional type composition is. And if we were to think about a, 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 a continent, uh, people online wouldn't be able to see that. If we were to think of a, a, a continent um, or a country or a geographic region, and we would divide it up into, into segments, like pixels, if you like. We could, for each pixel, define what currently is the ecosystem type in that pixel, and what, under future climatic conditions, the future um, community of a particular group, like large animals, is expected to be. And therefore, what functional type composition we've got now and what functional type composition will appear in the future. And therefore, as we see climatic envelopes shifting across the landscape, we can imagine these pixels are going to be changing color. And as each pixel changes color, the functional type composition is also going to change. 
And then we could start predicting what functional type composition would be best established in that system in order, in order to maintain the ecosystem function. So that's another area that I think it could be helpful. Next slide. So the final message is that we're living in a world that is changing very rapidly. We're living in a world in which wilderness, as we know it right now, is going to be wild. It might remain wild in the future. Areas that are not wild now might become wild in the future. And what becomes wild in the future might be domestic now. So we've got a lot of transitions happening. There's a lot of fluxes, a lot of changes, great cycling time. Um, we need to be clear about what we mean by rewilding. We need to be clear about what the science underpinning it is. And I think that all science that underpins anything in ecology has got to have a strong mathematical component. And the like to have you guys here. Okay. Thank you.